Good morning. morning. Very warm welcome to our worship this morning here at Mayfield Salisbury Parish Church and to all those who are online, you're also very welcome and good morning to you. Um, Last week I was talking in the light of what's happening in our world at the moment about slivers of light and possibilities of hope of all things being made new. And I think creation has served us up an example of that, a great example of that over the past day. We wake up to this beautiful sunny morning after all the storms of the last week, so it's wonderful to gather to worship in the glorious sunshine all around us. Timothy Keller said, you can't live the Christian life without a band of Christian friends, without a family of believers in which to find a place. So here might be that place for you, maybe for decades past and more to come, maybe just in recent times and looking to the future, or even just for today, if you're passing through, welcome to your family of believers in which you find a place. If you're able, we stand when we sing together. The words of the hymns are in the purple hymnaries before you, and there's one today that's printed on the order of service. Otherwise, we remain seated during our worship. And after worship today, everyone very welcome as ever to come through to the Bill McDonald Hall where there'll be tea and coffee and refreshments for you waiting. So please do come through if you can. And on the way past, you may have encountered over the last few weeks Hilary Watkinson raising money for the Wildlife and Environmental Society of Malawi. Some lovely calendars and other goods at the stall there on your way past. So do do uh, stop by and, uh, and look at uh, what Hillary has and say hello to Hillary on your way through. Tonight, um, there is youth group at six o'clock for all children, P7 and upwards. There's also Messy Church on next Saturday. We've been joining over the past year with Peacefield Parish Church, who hold a Messy Church once a month on the last Saturday of the month, which is for children and their parents or grandparents, and it's craft-based and fun and games and food and also Bible stories. So all are welcome. There's some uh, flyers out in the hall um, if you want a reminder. Um, Next Saturday from 4 till 6 at Priestfield Parish Church. All are welcome then. There's lots coming up and lots going on that you will see at the back of the order of service and do have a browse when you have the chance. I just raise with you one thing that's new. um, Well, various things are new, but one, one of the things that is new uh, is from vestry hours on a Wednesday afternoon. And uh, our probationary minister, Simon Hessett, and I will be available between two and four uh, in the vestry, just in the corridor there. If anyone wants to drop in and chat, whether that be about something to do with church or whether it be a pastoral issue or something you want to talk through, feel free to call by between two and four on a Wednesday. And Simon will be there. And if Simon isn't, I will be there instead. So doors open two to four every Wednesday up until Christmas. Next Sunday, we have two services as we do this morning at 9.30 and 10.45 next Sunday morning. Finally, I mentioned last week that sadly, uh, Douglas Curry had passed away. Douglas's funeral services are a week on Thursday, on Thursday the 2nd of November, and the times of the services are on the order of service at the back. Please do keep Rosemary and all the family in your thoughts and your prayers at this sad time for them. In the name of Christ, who is our peace, flickers of light and a candle for peace in the Holy Land. In the name of Christ, who is our peace, let us bring flickers of light for peace amongst our brothers and sisters and share Christ's peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Jimmy.
say together the words of our call to worship. Gather in our hearts, Lord. Our words speak of peace. Gather in our hearts, Lord. Let our actions speak of peace. Gather in our hearts, Lord. Let our lives speak of peace. Gather in our hearts, Lord. Let our worship speak of peace. Let us worship God. We sing, O God of Bethel, by whose hand. Let us come before God together in prayer. Shall we pray together? Loving God, be among us now. Show us your ways and guide us in our steps. Live in us that we might be people of resilient hope. Help us to hear your words, Lord, through Scripture challenging us to give to you all the things that are yours, reflecting the divine image, fulfilling your laws in the ways Jesus taught us by loving you with all our heart and our soul and loving every one of our neighbors on this earth as we love ourselves. Help us to remember, Lord, that all that we are and all we have are gifts from you, gifts to be shared in love, gifts to speak of peace and times of forgiveness, gifts to bring bread and water for those who hunger and thirst, for the yearning in their bodies or their souls to be satisfied. 
Holy One among us. We so often fall short in our words and our actions, and we ask you for your forgiveness as we do. Help us to be a holy people who receive your word with joy and live in your image. We celebrate, Lord, the dream of peace, not only the absence of conflict, but the presence of real compassion and community. We celebrate the dream of justice, not only of recognition of rights, but an inclusive dignity and equality. We celebrate, Lord, the dream of goodness, not only an end to violence and evil, but the nurture of kindness and love. We celebrate, Lord, the dream of salvation, not only of life beyond this earth, but wholeness, fullness, and restoration for all in this world. Loving God, we, your people, give you thanks and praise for the dream and the coming reality of your kingdom, a time of true peace, of shalom, as we come together in the words that your Son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Psalm 96, 1 to 13. Praise to God who comes in judgment. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. 
Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth.
Matthew 22, 15 to 22. The question about paying taxes. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. For the word of God revealed through scripture, thanks be to God. <laughs> May the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We were so used to seeing it every day of our lives. We'd open up our wallet or our purse or rummage around in our pockets and pull loose change out to pay for the bus or the chocolate bar from the corner shop or the stamps from the post office. And there it was on the reverse of each and every coin, the profile of the Queen's head, changing in its contours as she grew older over the decades, but still decidedly her. That's just what our UK coins looked like. But now they don't. Not that many people carry cash anymore, but I happened to have taken some out from the cash line the other day and made a purchase. And lo and behold, something very strange was given back to me. I thought it was a fake, perhaps. Maybe some shyster had got away with using his holiday money. Now he was back from Azerbaijan. For there was a picture of a bloke on the back of a 50p. But the slow cogs of the old brain slowly turned and it clicked into place. It is, of course, King Charles III, or fourth if you're a Jacobite, now just past the first year of his reign. Despite the change in monarch that will take some getting used to, the format of the coins remain much the same, including the abbreviated Latin inscription around the monarch's head at the side of each coin, which beforehand was DG Reg, and now is DG Rex, standing for Dei Gratia Rex, by the grace of God, King. It's almost as if the inscribers have been reading through Jesus' words and actions in our gospel passage that Patricia read for us from Matthew 22. It's almost as if they're acknowledging one of the boldest assertions made by Jesus, which would be almost unrecognizable to a Roman of his time and to some kings before Charles. The assertion that all are equal before God, that all are in need of his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness and his saving power, yes, even kings and emperors too that we should pray for our earthly rulers and not to them, as they are mortal humans and not divine, that only God is the true ruler of the world through Jesus Christ. Kings and emperors, even some presidents and prime ministers in our time, have claimed a divine mandate to act without fear of contradiction or consequence. But Jesus was telling us in our gospel passage today that they too must rely on the mercy of God and anticipate his judgment. In these days of the continuing horrors of what is unfolding in the Holy Land, in times of terrorism and atrocities of violence and bombing and killing, in times of a million refugees forced to flee and then trapped in an area the size of the island of Jura without water and food, in what the UN described on Friday as a hellhole, which is human created. It bodes us well to think again of the just exercise of might and power from human leaders in comparison to divine power and kingship. And this illustration of Jesus might help us in doing so. In his confrontation here with the Pharisees and the Herodians, Jesus was walking a tightrope, or more probably, in his case, he was probably walking the plank because he was being forced to make almost impossible choices and distinctions. The Pharisees must have thought that they had him at last. Either way, the game was up and his ragtag support from fishermen, tax collectors, and other riffraff would now surely melt away. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Notice lawful, they said, meaning in accordance with the law of God. Now, probably no one in history has gleefully paid taxes, but we accept them as almost inevitable. It was Benjamin Franklin who wrote that nothing is certain in life except death and taxes. And if it's the law and it's probably for the common good, most of us pay up and move on. But the taxes in first century Palestine were particularly harsh and unjust. 
The Roman taxes were levied annually on harvest and personal property, and they were paid in Roman coinage like the denarius. They put a heavy economic burden on the impoverished people of first century Palestine for very little benefit to themselves, and the taxes were deeply disliked. You can almost hear the smugness in the voices of the Pharisees as the question is asked. For if Jesus were to answer, yes, of course, it is lawful before God to pay these taxes, he risked alienating the oppressed Jews of Palestine and being branded a collaborator. But if he said, no, it's not lawful before God to pay these taxes, he would immediately have been dragged before the Roman governor, accused of sedition. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. But rather brilliantly, Jesus answered a question which was really about political allegiance and partisanship by splitting up what is lawful according to the laws of humanity and what is lawful in the eyes of God. He changed the focus so that the answer was both a political and a theological one. So Jesus took the coin by which the taxes were paid and on it was the head of the emperor, Tiberius Caesar, and his title, just like King Charles now. But the inscription around the emperor, unlike King Charles, didn't countenance for one second that Tiberius might be a human being being placed on a throne by the grace of God and subject to God's command. Instead, the inscription declared Tiberius overtly to be a divine ruler, to be a god himself. So this coin not only represented exploitation and oppression for the Jewish people, to them it was blasphemy. Looking at this coin in his hand after getting the Pharisees to confirm it was the head of the emperor and the nature of the inscription, Jesus then deftly widened the original question so that in effect it became a different one. Instead, he made it the question, what is it that bears God's image? When Jesus answered in, in verse 21, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. We've traditionally interpreted this as telling each of us to conform and to obey in two parallel places, to be good citizens in both civic and church communities. But maybe this answer that Jesus gives, effectively that there are two kings and two kingdoms, is somewhat deeper than that and a lot more wide-reaching. Maybe he's actually talking about images, human and divine, one on a coin and one in the heart saying what kind of people and actions bear God's image and setting up not a parallel obedience, but two contrasting ones. Tertullian in the third century wrote of this passage, render to Caesar Caesar's image, which is on a coin. Render to God God's image, which is on humanity. Maybe Jesus is really saying here that the emperor can stamp his image and his claim pedigree as far and wide as he wants, and he can use human power, military might, and violence and oppression as much as he is capable of to back it all up. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give him these coins. He will get many of them, but these are the image of a man and not of God. The coin that bears the stamp of the maker's mark, that is the coin of our flesh and blood, of our heart and of our soul, and that is the true image of God. And we give to God the things that are God's when we give ourselves, whenever what we do bears a divine image, just as the palm of God's hand bears ours. And in terms of the law of God, what could that be? What is it that we could do which bears a divine image that we can give to God? Well, we're told that all of the law is fulfilled in loving God and in loving our neighbors as ourselves. That, says Jesus, is superior to human power and might, however frightening their weapons might be, whatever their claims to divine right. It is us loving God 
and loving our neighbors as ourselves that bears the image of God. It is power and might and violence that might bear the human image. So there is loyalty to Caesar. There is room for that, but it is subordinated to loyalty to God. There is room to obey human law, but it's subordinated to the law of God, which speaks of being fulfilled in love for God and of all people, love for them just as for ourselves. We are walking a tightrope ourselves these days if we hazard to voice even a calm and considered opinion either way on what's happening before our eyes in the Middle East. Point out injustices amongst the horrors perpetrated by either side and we can be called out and accused of either supporting terrorists or being apologists for state persecution. But we just might want to say that is wrong. Even worse, we might be accused of being hostilely prejudiced against one people group or another. So I'll say nothing about what is happening directly. That's for you to decide. Only how these words of Jesus might be read. And if you like, you can draw your own parallels, which might be quite different from mine. On the one hand, in his answer relating to Caesar, Jesus does not condone violent and bloody revolt or terrorism against an occupying state, no matter how harsh and disempowering that occupation might be. Or as the commentator Susan Grove Eastman puts it, for Jesus, talk of revolution is cheap but the suffering experienced by the victims of violent conduct is extreme. For Jesus, the way is of peace, and all protest, all solutions, and all resolutions are to be non-violent. But on the other hand, as Eastman also says, his words provide no basis for a theology of the state that accords it a divine mandate and therefore carte blanche to act as it pleases. So give Caesar his due, but only if it doesn't conflict with what is truly lawful, the law of God, a love of peace, and the unity of all humanity. As soon as a state's answer is violence and suppression, cruelty and death from one people group directed to another, Jesus says it is not acting in the image of God either. So neither the violent and barbaric terrorist, nor the violent and unjust state, says Jesus, are of God, who holds ultimate power and rule and majesty. So the question then becomes for us here from this passage, not whether we should pay our taxes, but what do we expect and demand from the government that is supported by our taxes, and from all governments that in turn it supports? And what does our conscience expect and demand of us if there's an apparent contrast between the way people use or abuse power anywhere in the world and our faith? Meantime, we keep ringing the bells that can still be rung. We pray for peace and for slivers of light. We may be surrounded by storms, literally in the last few days. But as each day breaks, as each dawn rises, each sun shines as it does this morning. There is fresh hope. With the psalmist in Psalm 96, we cling to the trust and the expectation that God is always creating something new. And so we in turn might sing a new song to God. Like the psalmist, we might sing of God's glory and majesty as king over all nations and over all peoples. A God who, it is said, will come to judge the whole earth with equity and righteousness and truth. Almost as a matter of relief, the judgment then ultimately is not ours. And the final decision on the right and the wrong of it all in these days is not ours either. But it will, in time, belong to God. Amen.
Let us come together in prayer. Shall we pray together? Our companion God, we praise you for the life-changing journeys out of darkness towards light that you inspire. As we travel the road of our life's journey, one of joy and of struggle, one of rejoicing and of pain, we give thanks that you go with us as our leader and our friend. You bear the image of peace and of love before us. You have taken us by the hand and led us, giving us guidance and support. Your presence travels with us, and we are grateful today. We thank you, Lord, that you have strengthened us for the walk of life in faith, for the labor of love, the resilience of hope, that you have made us imitators in your image of your saints and disciples and of our Lord Jesus Christ, pale shadows though we sometimes are. Almighty God, ruler of the ends of the earth, we pray for those to whom you have entrusted power and responsibility. We think of our own country, our prime minister and first minister, those elected to office as members of both parliaments, those who serve in government and the civil service, those in opposition with their mandate to challenge and debate government policies and decisions. Lord, when they are faced with the horrendous continuing violence and tension in Israel-Palestine, grant them wisdom and insight patience and integrity, open-mindedness and humility, that they might be equipped to honor the trust placed in them, standing by principles rather than sloganeering, ensuring that food and water is made available to all people now who face starvation in Gaza, working together for peace. We pray for those in authority in all lands, leaders of nations large and small, leaders of territories and people groups. Grant them the guidance and the gifts they need to lay aside anger, bitterness, and the might of their weaponry and political power, to govern wisely, that they might work for the good of all their people in the land and not just their own that they might strive to promote peace and justice and harmony. And we pray, Lord, for those caught in the crossfire of violence and war, the civilians affected by the actions of extremists from amongst their own communities, divided by rival factions, oppressed by regimes. Support those who suffer under such authority. Be with those who mourn those who have lost. Strengthen those who struggle, Lord, to bring non-violent change to such places so that the time might come when peace and truth and justice will prevail. We pray for all people in Israel, Palestine. We pray for all people in Ukraine and Russia. Just as we pray for those in our own country We've been affected this week by the storms and are counting the cost in their possessions and their emotions. Just as we pray too, Lord, for ourselves and for those in our own lives who need to feel the strength of your presence and your love for them at this time. Folk who we name for you now in a short time of silence. Lord of peace, bring peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
to invite you to join me in a short prayer written by the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, Sally Foster Fulton, a prayer of peace for the Holy Land. Let us pray. Lord God, in days to come they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. God, it is said that you are the peace that passes all understanding. We sit now staggered at how quickly the fragile half-peace in Israel-Palestine that had been brought together has unraveled. The lessons that have been so desperately needed to be learned have been laid aside, Lord, as the instruments of war begin their horrible, haunting reprise. Lord, call all humanity back to its senses. We pray ceaselessly for our brothers and sisters in Israel and Palestine, for we are all family, and when one part suffers, we are all depleted. Peace in pieces is a collective shared shame. For the angry and abused and frightened among us, who strike out in a distorted quest for victory, help us to find ways to convince that there is no victory to be found in violence. Peacemaking is a daunting path to tread, Lord, especially when fear follows so closely behind. So breathe your loving spirit into hearts and help us to walk your way. God, you are the peace that passes all understanding. So help us all to understand how to find you. Amen. Our closing hymn, number 459, Crown Him With Many Crowns. We say together the words of our closing responses. To a troubled world, peace from Christ. To a waiting world, hope from Christ. To a searching world, love from Christ. 
And may the peace, the hope, and the love of Christ be with us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer, be with us all and with everyone whom we love, this day and forevermore.